there are two types of players in Valorant. There's these guys, and then there's these guys. Actually, there are three types. The third type is these guys, but let's be honest, this type is rare. So let's talk about the first two types. These are the people who are baiters and the people who just need to push every single round regardless of what's happening. There's obviously a problem with both of these playstyles, and it takes a really smart player to recognize in the moment exactly when you should be playing aggressive and when you should be playing more passively. And for a lot of players, these issues stem from something fairly simple, and that is confidence. Specifically, confidence in their aim. If you've ever wondered why some players can get away with making the most aggressive peaks, most of the time when it comes down to is they're confident in their aim, so they're confident in their peaks. What it also comes down to is they caught your team slipping because generally there's a reason you shouldn't re-peak every single angle, but that's beside the point. Now taking a look at more passive players, oftentimes these players are referred to as baiters. These players are generally not as confident in their aim and feel they need to rely more on the enemies making mistakes and bringing opportunities to them rather than them going out and trying to make these plays happen themselves. These players don't even always have bad aim, sometimes their aim is actually fine, they just lack the confidence to make the plays. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the baiters today though, we're going to be primarily focusing on players that are too aggressive with their plays and how to recognize when it's generally good to play aggressive versus when it's bad to play aggressive. And to do that, we're going to be reviewing some of our viewer submitted VOD reviews from the Discord. So if you'd like to get your VOD reviewed as well, be sure that you're not late to the party and check out that link in the description below and become part of our rapidly growing new Discord channel. But how exactly do you detect when you should and when you shouldn't play aggressively? Well, I can't tell you 100% of the time what situations you should or shouldn't play aggressive as it's all relative, but I can give you some decent guidelines. One of the first signs of when you should play aggressive is when your team is down in numbers. This is one of the easiest ways to determine whether or not you should try to make a play. Because if your team is already ahead in numbers, you are not the ones who need to make a play. You're already winning, and if you stay on track of trading out your teammates correctly, you should mathematically win that round. However, on the other hand, if your team is behind in numbers, that's when you should generally be looking for an opening and attempting to even out the odds for your team. This is generally when it's more okay to try to make a play. Now, you're still going to want to try and make plays that have a high percentage chance of succeeding, However, it's a lot more acceptable for you to take risks when you're already losing the round than it is for you to take risks when your team is on the track of winning the round. Because risks are just that. Risks. Which means it's risky. Which means you're taking a risk. And risky plays are really cool for Twitter clips. However, by definition, they generally won't work out all of the time and have a chance of losing you rounds. Let's take a look at a replay from our Skillcap.com subscriber, Aku. Notice in this round, spoilers, both teams' Reynas are actually going to do something that could potentially lose their team the round. We're going to break down each of these things individually, so don't worry, just stick with us. The first thing you're going to notice in the round is his team's Reyna is going to get walled up by Sage for an off-angle into Tiles, and then after whiffing the kill, she is going to drop down deeper into Catwalk. Considering one of Reyna's biggest strengths is her ability to dismiss into safety after getting a kill, I don't generally recommend removing your only escape route from the equation. However, you'll notice despite her doing this, she's actually not going to get super punished for it right away. And actually, his team's Phoenix is going to pick up a kill on a main at the start of the round. This is awesome, his team is up one kill, they're sitting pretty, and all they have to do right now is continue on the path to victory, right? Sounds awesome, but now Aku is going to try and gain some more info for his team, which again, no problem with this. While he's droning out of mid, his Reyna is actually going to attempt to capitalize on this and pick up another kill in the round. Now, I would even say following this drone might be slightly risky, but she does end up getting a kill off of it, so sweet. Now they're up two kills. It's a 5v3 currently, and surely they can't lose this, right? Well, rather than backing off and taking the two kills, Reyna is actually going to decide to push further. And not only that, this is going to cause the Sage to attempt to swing out to help her as well. And just like that, not only does the enemy team pick up two kills, but Reyna now has her ultimate as well since she got up from killing the Sage. Notice how quickly a 5v3 turned into a 3v3 because two players decided to aggress in a situation where they really didn't need to. Reyna could have fallen back and Sage could have just watched the cross into market and waited for their team so they could play numbers. Now some of you might watch this and think maybe Sova could have helped the Reyna, which might be valid. However, after getting naded off by the Rays, he was actually immediately called to back up towards B by his teammates as well. So it makes sense in this situation that he might fall back. 
The main thing I want to point out here though is how one player's actions not only nullified her own kill in middle, making the trade a one for one, but it also got her teammate killed because Sage tried to help her and got peeked from somewhere else. And it gave Reyna her ultimate in a situation where she didn't have it before. Now watch later in this round how things start to play out. Aku's team is positioned at a 3v3 for retake in a round where it previously was a 5v3. The enemy Reyna has activated her ultimate and they currently don't have mid control because they lost it when Sage and Reyna died in middle. So now in their retake position where two players are on site and one player is in market, they inevitably are going to have to walk through a crossfire here. Now in the future, if you're in this situation, what I would generally recommend is having one player hold CT and the other two players go to clear out mid and market together so that way they can avoid this crossfire. But that's not the topic of this video, so let's move on. Now I promised you there would be two mistakes in this round, and the second mistake is about to happen right now. Notice how the enemy Reyna actually is going to peek Aku in spawn and pick up a quick kill onto him. Now although she got the kill, that does not make this a good peek, and I want to really drill this into your head, just because something works does not mean it was smart. Because what this Reyna decided to do was dry peek three players solo, giving up the crossfire she initially had, because she was too impatient to just wait for the enemies to push out. And this was the whole topic of the video. Because this Reyna is clearly confident. She's a good shot and she knows it, but the problem is sometimes she's going to catch people off guard like this. And sometimes she's going to look exactly like the other Reyna who pushed out middle looking for more kills and got herself killed and lost her team the round. Take a look at the other examples of players who maybe are just too confident in their aim. This next clip is going to be from a Radiant level lobby, and by the way, this last clip was from an Immortal level game as well. So just to give you perspective of how common these issues actually are in every rank, players are constantly making this mistake of overpeaking, and it's constantly getting punished. This next clip is from a Radiant Yoru main named Who Framed Me, and he's actually going to be spectating his teammates during a post plant on A site. His team is currently on an eco round, which means that it's actually awesome that they are even able to get the bomb onto site in the first place, and on top of that, they have numbers right now, which is amazing. Now, as soon as they start getting the spike planted, Sage is actually going to go wall CT, and then the smoke in heaven will fade, and it exposes the enemy omen is actually currently in heaven aiming down on them. Now, let's have a learning experience here. What should Frame's team do about the omen in heaven? Should they A, double peek him, B, have one player deal with him, or C, do nothing? Well, actually, to your surprise, I would probably recommend that they do nothing about the omen. And by do nothing, what I mean is that they should hide from him and either wait for the smoke to recharge from their omen or wait for him to jump out of heaven. Because as omen, he can't really do anything from heaven if they don't peek him. If nobody is challenging him, he needs to jump out of heaven to do anything. And when he jumps out, he's inaccurate and incredibly vulnerable. All these players needed to do to win this round was not peek the omen. But instead, Sage is going to get killed peeking the omen, and then Sky is going to try to peek the omen as well and get caught off guard when Sova pushes her short. So to emphasize this again, all they needed to do to win this round was not take that gunfight. This is a situation where playing passively would have been far more rewarding than playing aggressively, and all it comes down to is just the players feeling a little too overconfident in their aim. So we have a few different examples of players taking dangerous peeks that could lose them rounds. The first one being when Reyna jumped off a catwalk to take a duel solo. The second one being when the other Reyna gave up a positional advantage to peek three enemy players in spawn. Notice how, by the way, in this second example, her team isn't actually technically ahead in numbers, but it's just the idea of risking some sort of advantage your team has just for the sake of taking a duel. And then our third round, of course, where they not only gave up a numbers advantage, but also a positional advantage by taking the duel on the player in heaven. These are clearly rounds where players got over aggressive, but what is an example of a time where a player played aggressively and it was actually a really good reason? Well, take a look at the next match that we have where Viper and Jet are in a 2v3 on Icebox. Notice how in this situation, obviously they are behind in numbers and need to come up with some sort of pick to even out the round. Because right now, as it is, if they try to initiate the endgame, as we talked about in one of our recent videos, they are going to be at a pretty good disadvantage. What they want to do is finish out the mid game by evening out the odds and then transition into the end game by planting the bomb. So what Jet ends up doing here, rather than just planting the bomb when she hears the enemies rotate off site, she's actually going to follow them deeper into spawn looking for a pick. This seems like it's a play that is a little bit over aggressive. She's going deeper into enemy territory with the spike, and if she loses it, it could really be detrimental to her team. However, the thing is, if she dies here, it doesn't really matter all that much if she has spike or not. Viper would still be left in a 1v3, and it would be incredibly hard for her to win this regardless. This is part of a concept that we call risk versus reward. 
In the previous examples, we talked about how players are risking a lot by taking solo duels when their team has numbers advantage because their team is already ahead. They don't need to be the ones making these plays, so by looking for the duels, the risk is super high and the reward isn't because they are already ahead in numbers. However, in this example, Jet is risking losing her team the round by pushing spawn. However, losing her team the round doesn't really mean that much because they already are on course to lose the round anyway. And the possible reward gained from getting a kill is that her team now has the advantage because it will put them into a 2v2 with the spike about to go down. Notice how there's not a lot of risk because they don't have the advantage. Whereas in the other situation, players are risking a lot by taking duels because they do have the advantage. Then notice how once again, after putting the round into a 2v1, both the Viper and the Jet now back up and play the numbers advantage, making sure to be in positions that they can trade off of each other. This is a great example of how immediately once they get the numbers, they switch gears and start to play more of a defensive role. Once again, they have the advantage and the ball is now in the opposing team's court. But to give you one more example of a similar situation, let's take a look at one of our Radiant players, Jaden, during a recent Smurf commentary that you can find on our website. Notice how in this round, Jaden is put into a position during overtime where if you lose this round, the game is over. Jaden recognizes this and that's why when his team is put into a 3v5 situation, he knows that if he plays this round passively, he is going to get pushed and they will lose the game. So rather than backing himself into a corner, what he does is he pushes forward so that when he gets a pick, he has somewhere to go back to rather than just getting traded out immediately. When Jaden pushes out of pocket here, he is very much looking for a duel right now. He may be leaving the safety of this corner, but he knows that to win this round, somebody needs to make a play, so he steps up. Then after grabbing his first kill, he dismisses back to cover that he had previously left, and then once again begins looking for another duel. Because of these plays, he was able to turn a 3v5 into a 2v1 with the help of his team, and it was in a situation where he absolutely needed to do something, otherwise the game would be over. This is an example of a situation where taking advantage of that good aim and looking for duels is the best thing that you can do. And if you'd like to get a glimpse of how Jaden masterfully plays the rest of this game, then you can be sure to check out the rest of the VOD available on our website. Link in the description below. I hope this video was helpful for you to get an understanding of when you should and when you shouldn't be taking duels in Valorant. It's awesome if you're feeling confident in your aim and looking to take duels all over the place, but whether you're in the low ranks of Bronze, Silver, or Gold, or maybe moving on to the higher ranks of Platinum, Diamond, and Immortal, the biggest thing I want to encourage of you all is to try to think more about risk versus reward in your games. This stuff goes so much deeper than just numbers. Sometimes it's positional advantage, sometimes it's gun advantage, sometimes it's even things such as losing abilities that your team could still have, such as smokes, flashes, or ultimates. There are right and wrong times to take duels, and if you're a player who has a bad habit of taking duels when you shouldn't, I highly recommend that you do some VOD review and fix that issue. Because at the end of the day, this is going to be something that bars you from ranking up to whatever rank is next for you. As always though, if you guys enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe to the channel down below, and other than that, thank you all for watching. My name's King, and we here at Skillcapped want to thank you all for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.